Okay, hello there, Year 11. Uh, today we're going to be talking all about kinetic theory and Brownian motion. Uh, these are two quite important parts of your course, uh, and they are uh, parts that cover everything to do with particle motion. Uh, now, you've done a lot of this already. You did this in Year 9, and you've done it a lot in chemistry as well. So hopefully most of what we're going to cover today shouldn't be too new for you. So let's just start off with a little uh, recap. So I want you to think about the particles of solids, liquids and gases. First of all, uh, do they, they flow? So flow uh, means uh, can they move from one location to another? Uh, so you should know that uh, particles uh, cannot flow in solids, they can flow in liquids and they can flow in gases. Um, now there are some uh, types of solids that act as though they can flow. Uh, for instance sand, yes it can flow from one place to another, um, but if you think about it sand is really a collection of smaller things that can't flow. So at a molecular level it can't flow. An individual sand grain cannot flow. Uh, you're asked do they take the shape of their container? Um, so for uh, solids uh, they do not. They have a fixed shape. Liquids, however, take the shape of obviously the base of their container. Um, if the container looks like this, then your liquid uh, will fill it up like that. Whereas if you had a container that looked like this, that same volume of water um, would fill it now in a brand new shape. Same amount of water, but just looks different. Um, and for gases, yes, they will always uh, take the shape of their container as well. Can you decrease their volume? So by volume, we mean the amount of space that they take up. And we're saying, can we make, squeeze them together and, and make them take up a smaller amount of space? So solids, no, you can't. Liquids, uh, no, you can't either. Sorry about that. That's a cross. Uh, but gases, yes, you can. And it's a density, medium, high or low. So generally speaking, solids have the highest density liquids have a medium density and gases have a low density. Now there are some important ex exceptions to that. Um, <laughs> annoyingly it's the most uh, common chemical found on our planet and water actually is less dense as a solid than it is as a liquid but that's really unusual. Generally speaking solids are slightly denser than their liquids. So there's quite a lot of uh, key spec points for you to get through in this section. Um, I'm not going to read them all out to you. Um, basically, we're covering all of these things today. If you want to pause the video and read through them, you're more than welcome to. So to give you a basic idea of what we're studying, kinetic theory is a model for solids, liquids and gases, which helps to describe the way they act as they do. It's not perfect, um, but it works pretty well. Um, so it says that they are made of particles with different separations and abilities to move. Um, and this is where we come into the kind of stuff that you should be pretty familiar with. Um, this is what we've studied so far. It's got other ways. You can read everything. Um, these are the classic pictures that you show. One thing I want to make really clear, for the pictures of a liquid, um, you can see that they are all touching. Yeah, All of these uh, particles are drawn so that they're touching each other. That's a really important thing to remember because a lot of people forget to include that in their diagrams. Um, and you'll often see it drawn like this, sort of higgledy-piggledy, but not touching, but closer than it is in a gas. That's wrong. You mustn't draw it like that. Even though you'll see it loads of places all over the internet, that is wrong. Um, so for the, the key difference between a solid and liquid then, although they're all touching each other, is in a solid those particles are randomly arranged and they vibrate around a fixed position. So one particle here will vibrate up and down and left and right like that. Over here in a liquid, the particles are free to move. So it might go on a little journey and move around and kind of wiggle around and, and swap their positions very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, they can move around each other. Okay, Gases, basically there's no intellectual forces between the particles, so they move around quickly in all directions, um, mm -hmm. going wherever they please, um, and they're relatively mm -hmm. far apart mm -hmm. from each other. So I want to show you a quick little video um, showing some... Uh, random motions of particles um, to give you an idea of how they move. So I'm 
trying to give credit here. Uh, this is from Pollen Grains and Water uh, by Yo Yong Kyat. Um, and it's a really nice little explanation of what happens here. Let's just cut off the sound. Um, so, Brownian motion, it's one of those really interesting things that we've seen uh, in several different uh, parts of physics and parts of uh, chemistry and biology as well. And basically, if you look at very, very, very small things under a microscope, you see them appear to jiggle about. Um, so, show it again here. These are individual pollen grains under a microscope. And when you watch them under the microscope, it appears that they jiggle randomly. And if you watch one for a long period of time, it will kind of trace out a strange curved path um, and move around in, in unusual ways. So what we want to do as physicists is understand the reason for why that happens. Um, so. This is another example of it. What we've drawn here is, here is my pollen grain, so it's nice and large, and surrounding it are water molecules. Now in the videos that you saw, almost forgotten how to spell molecules, uh, in the video that you saw, obviously the water molecules are far too tiny for us to make them out as individual particles, but we know they're there because that's stuff that we've um, done for uh, that they've done for years so um, we have to try and explain this behavior um, another way of showing this so, so there, there's two ways that you might see it one is with pollen grains in water the other one um, is with something called a oops, excuse me is with something called a smoke cell this is a smoke cell here um, so the idea of a smoke cell is you have a lamp and you shine light into a uh, glass box full of smoke. And you often get the smoke by uh, lighting some paper on fire and just putting some smoke inside it. And again, it's the same idea. So this time, instead of having pollen, you could have a smoke particle, um, which would be like a little lump of soot, basically, or just some unburnt fuel, um, and it would be surrounded by uh, air molecules. And in both cases, we see it randomly moving around um, and seem to follow no clear path. Um, so there are a couple of ways of explaining this. The basic idea is that particles in liquids and gases, and we call liquids and gases fluids, they move in zigzags randomly. So if I've got one particle here, it'll go over here, then over here, then over here, then over here. And we call that Brownian motion. Now, why do they move around randomly? Um, they do that because they're constantly being bombarded by other particles in the fluid. Just move my head to the side, in the fluid. Um, now, if I have a mixture of different particles here, what happens is, can you see how this red particle has got three particles on one side of it? So in that instance in time, that red particle may have three collisions that forces it to start moving off in that direction because those three light particles have all whacked into it. But for this one over here, it's going to have two particles hitting it that way, so that particle is going to move off in that direction. But a little bit later, if this uh, red particle has moved to over here, now the blue particles may well be coming in this direction because the blue particles are all moving around randomly as well. And if the blue particles do all randomly move that way, then now the red particle is going to be shoved off in that direction. And the idea of Brownian motion is that it's completely random. The direction that the particles are traveling in is random, which means that sometimes you'll get more collisions on one side than on the other side. And that means that sometimes there'll be a net force one way, sometimes there'll be a net force the other way. And overall, it makes things just jiggle around. And you can't predict where they're going to go because, as we say, it's random. 
Now at uh, IGCSE, that randomness is kind of about as much as you need to know. You just need, to, you just need this idea that particles move around randomly as they hit more on one side than the other. Um, the, it changes the direction or the, changes the total force in a particle and it changes the direction the particle is travelling in. When we get to A level, we do loads of really cool maths to show how that works. Um, and then we can do some really interesting um, things. One of my favourite derivations, ask some of the uh, A2 level physicists and they can, they can tell you how that works. Okay, um, so CIE, as you know, love a key definition, so here's one for you. Brownian motion is the random movement of microscopic particles in a fluid as a result of continuous collisions with molecules of the surrounding medium. So what this means is stuff around it. In other words, as things hit it around a particle, that particle moves. So I've got a little extended writing task for you. What I'd like you to do is describe and explain the difference in motion of a gas particle at high and low temperatures. This is something that should be fairly familiar with you um, for uh, a number of years now. So just have a go and see how you get on. Okay, so the answer to that one is um, the temperature of substance is proportional to the kinetic energy of the molecules. That's a really um, posh way of saying it, but basically if the temperature of a gas increases, they've got more kinetic energy and the gas particles move around faster. So I'm looking for anything to do with more temperature, they move faster. Now can you explain how a gas particle can cause pressure? So I'll give you a little hint here. If you imagine the wall of a box here, think about your individual particles of gas. In the yellow is a terrible colour to use. Think about your individual uh, particles of gas travelling around, again, randomly, and think about how they move in all directions, and think about what will cause a pressure mm -hmm. on an area. Okay. So we're looking here for gas particles are free to move within any container and they will collide with the walls of a container exerting a force. Now we know that because uh, if you think back to year 10 we've done uh, impulse. So if this is the wall of a container then I know that if I have a particle that comes in like that with speed m, sorry, uh, velocity v and speed and mass mm -hmm. m, then after it's collided, it'll travel away from the wall like that with uh, speed m, and assuming that, sorry, mass m, god, mass m, and assuming that its speed hasn't changed, it will still have v um, as its velocity, but you can see the direction's changed. So what I could say um, is that the change in momentum Remember, do you remember that uh, triangle sign is delta, which means change in, change in momentum will be 2 mv, because this one would be uh, mv, this one would be also mv, but in the other direction, so I could call it minus mv, so that would be uh, mv minus minus mv, which would be mv plus mv, so I'd get a 2 mv momentum change. And then if you remember that force is equal to change in momentum divided by time taken well it's clear if I've had a change in momentum I must have had a force acting on my wall now any force divided by an area is pressure you can remember pressure is force divided by area so because a wall, because a wall has to have an area if I'm causing a force in it, I've got to have caused a pressure. Um, so we can think of this as an example here. Um, let's think about if I blow into a balloon, the balloon expands. Why does the balloon expand? It expands because there's a greater pressure inside the balloon than outside. Now in terms of air particles, that means there are more collisions of the air particles inside the balloon than outside, and therefore there's more force on the inside of the balloon than the outside. Okay. Right, question three. What, therefore, would an increase in temperature do to pressure? So we've said so far that pr uh, temperature is the 
uh, equivalent to the speed of particles moving around. And we said that uh, if we increase, sorry, and we said that pressure is caused by particles hitting it. So what does a temperature increase do to pressure? Well, hopefully you get the idea that if the temperature of a gas increases, it'll have more kinetic energy and the particles will move around faster. So if the volume of the balloon in the previous example doesn't change, moving faster gas particles means there'll be more collisions acting on the surface of the balloon, increasing the pressure. So again, if this is my wall, this particle is going to hit it more often because there's more particles moving... Well, sorry, there aren't more particles. The particles are all moving more quickly, so those random collisions will happen more quick, more often. So the force will increase, therefore the pressure will increase. You can also think the velocity of all of them will go up, and we've said before that force is rate of change of momentum, so the velocity goes up, the momentum's gone up, which means that the force has gone up as well.